guys, we're back here. It's Thursday afternoon, four o'clock in my workshop um, for the Skill Centre at Home uh, series of live videos. Um, well, I hope you liked Tuesday's um, edition. We made um, a lamp there. We made a scrap wood lamp. Um, and the, heart, the idea of that one was just to show the process of long haul boring. Um, and we finished the lamp whilst, um, whilst you're away, or over the, the couple of days. And I think you agree, it's turned out quite nice. Um, it was to replicate a lamp that I turned 36, 7, 38 years ago, maybe. My first ever piece of wood turning. Um, and it was just one of those things we fancied to do. And I thought, well, we, we someone's asked if we could do some long haul boring, so let's do it on, on a scrap wood lamp. So that's the lamp. I just wanted to very, very quickly, before we move on, just to show you what, um, what, what how we're finishing this. So this has got a finishing oil on it at the moment but we've bored all the way down through the center and I then um, put a thread in the top and it does depend on what you wish to, um, how you wish to finish your lamp, um, whether you put a small brass um, a nipple in the top or whether you put an actual plate and they of course hold the, um, the lamp holders afterwards. If you're going to put the small one in um, then what I tend to do, I, I bought myself uh, and that's an imperial measurement actually. I bought myself just a little um, tap um, and cut a thread down through the center of the lamp, which I can then thread the nipple in with. Oh, you can get, would you grab that for me, Charlie? Um, you can get imperial and metric um, versions of these. Axminster currently do imperial ones, so that's an imperial tap that I've got. But once you've done that, of course, it's dead easy just to screw that in you know, without hammering it down or anything. So, so an easy, an easy adjustment. So I just wanted to quickly show you that before we moved on. Of course, we, um, we had a second project on the go. If you remember my, my attempts at thread chasing, um, and we were making uh, box threads. So we had a 50% success rate on that one. Um, I was rather pleased with the, the second attempt. I haven't finished that into a box. I will for the next time we meet up on next Tuesday. Um, but that's a nice little a little bit of thread chasing there. If you've had a chance to see Alan Batty's video, um, I'm sure you would have learned a lot from that one as well. But uh, there we are, that's the, the little box part done. So again, just a reminder from, from Tuesday's session, we've got a birthday boy that, behind the camera today, 16 year old Charlie. Um, so he's just broken away from his celebrating to be cameraman. Um, so as usual, ask questions, you know, as we're going. Um, the, the project for today was inspired by one of your questions. A question from Brian. Um, he watched a, a video by Olivia Gomez, French wood turner, Olivia Gomez, um, how to make a scrap wood bowl. Basically gluing lots and lots of pieces of timber together. Um, and then turning a bowl from that. And of course, at, at the moment where it might be um, tough to get supplies, to get bowl blanks and things like that, this is a perfect solution, of course. Um, so let's have a look at what we've done. If you remember on Tuesday, I showed you all the pieces of timber ready to be glued together. Charlie, can you pan down just for the minute? We're gonna show you the glued up section. So I've been busy. I've glued up the pieces of timber. I've also since cut the the blank into a, a bowl blank. Obviously I'm left here with the corners, a little bit closer Charlie, right in, so I can, so I can see the top of the bowl blank. Well done. Um, so I've just cut that on the bandsaw, so I've got my corners there. Um, nothing, nothing tricky about that really. All I've done was glue this in three sections. So a middle section, glued that together, the outer section glued together, then glued the, the three together. Otherwise, what you find is quite difficult to get everything to lie flat. They tend to um, move around when you're clamping. Um, you can put bridging pieces in to stop that, but you know all of those pieces would have been a nightmare to try and glue together at once. So three sections. Not only that, it meant I could use um, uh, G cramps instead of big sash cramps to do most of the work until the final glue. So that's what we're starting with. I have planed the surface nice and smooth. So we've got a good level um, surface to put the face plate on. Um, and so we're just gonna turn a very basic bowl shape to show off the timber. We're not gonna do anything fussy. It'd be wasted on a, a, an interesting piece like this. Um, so this is gonna be a, a, a nice, simple, how to turn a bowl, um, start to finish, and then we can remove the base. Um, 
I might keep those pieces. Um, they, they're quite interesting. There might be a project we can do with those later on. So I'm just going to keep those for the moment. Um, what's your view about turning out a bowl? Edge to centre or centre out and which is best? We're about to see. Which is best, the way that works for you. Um, I can certainly show you the way I teach. And I'm going to explain the reasons why we do it this way as well. Basically, it's all about um, grain direction. You think about um, that old analogy of planing off an end grain board. Wherever possible, we want to be cutting into supported grain so we don't break fibres away. So for this instance, think about your grain orientation. It would be different for a bowl blank, a conventional bowl blank, um, you would turn in a different direction than you would, say, for instance, a hollow form, which would be through the length of the limb. Um, they're two different grain orientations. So I'll show you um, in a moment. In fact, let me just grab a hollow form and a bowl, and we can we can demonstrate this. So there's a there's a couple of rough turn pieces here. Hollow form, bowl blank. Um, so what we've got, if you think about it, that's going to be turned that way. Okay, so I'm turning everything on this piece down this way, down this way. This piece, we've still got the grain running through, but if I attempt, let's say, if I attempt um, to start turning this piece up, um, we're going to start breaking the grain away. Uh, sorry, down, we're going to start breaking the grain away because the grain's going that way instead. So it's a completely different grain orientation. As the tree is growing, this is for example, but um, let me grab another bulb line. As the tree is growing, they're actually taken from different parts of the tree. Let me get another rough turn. There we are. That's the piece of apple up here. The tree on that bulb line was growing that way. The tree on this hollow form is growing that way. So you can see how different the grain is running. So what I'm going to do or I'm about to do is turn this way and then on the inside turn that way. If you do the opposite you're turning against the grain so you get a lot more breakout, a lot more tear. You can't get the bevel rubbing as efficiently either, um, certainly on the inside anyway, um, and you'll lead to more, um, more issues. We have got a question from Lee um, Lee has just started out on wood turning. Um, he's having a few problems with catches, with bowl gouges. Uh, again, I'm going to show you why that happens. Again, it's all about presentation of the gouge. Um, bowl gouges are one of those tools. Once you get them working correctly, they're sweet. When you're starting out, and if you don't know, flute direction can cause you really nasty catches. So we're going to look at the flute direction for you. So that's all prepped and ready to go on. I'm going to turn this like at the end of the bowl. My, my and then Charlie's safety means that we're going to make sure we're fully protected. So Charlie's got a full face visor on. I've got my, uh, my respirator on. So like on uh, Tuesday, I might be a little bit muffly, um, but it's just to protect me. Um, I'll shout a little bit louder and all that. Okay. So, you know, we've glued up. We're using a good quality glue, an in-date glue. So this one's the Type Bond 2, uh, a nice fresh one. It's not been frozen. It's not been left out in the workshop in the cold over winter, all that sort of thing. It's a fresh bottle. Um, so it's in date and, and good. Um, I glued the uh, blanket on my bench, but protecting the bench with a bit of, with an Axminster Tools old carrier bag, so recycling. Um, and just to protect that from glue sticking to the bench. Otherwise, I'd have come back the next morning and find that part of my workbench. So just to make sure, so a little bit of cling film, I'll carry a bag, keep the bag because you can use it over and over and over again. Okay, so nice and tight on there. Um, I'll put my dust mask on in a moment. Let's get everything set up first. So we're going to start, and it's entirely up to you. You can start on the edge if you wish, if it's very out of centre. This piece is fairly central, so I've got this, this centre quite well. All right there, Charlie. Um, and uh, I made sure I put the faceplate right in the centre of the centre board as well. So when we finish, it's nice and uh, nice and even. So if I just pop that tool rest close, Charlie, can we come? What angles gonna be best? I come this way, this way, and you can come as close as you like to start with. So if I, okay, let's have a little bit of light as well. I'm going to 
just put my pencil there. That's going to give away my centre point. Now that's not too bad. We're a little bit out for some reason, but not too bad. But that's going to give away where I can start. I want to make sure my tool rest is below that centre point. So if you see, if I draw a line there that I can still get to centre, I'm below the centre point. I'll start off with a 3.8 gouge, a 10 mil bowl gouge, just to start with, and I'm going to skim the centre, create my hole point, um, and I'm going to use a, uh, the C jaws. So these are C jaws, and these have a nice little lip on the inside that we're going to use to grip. So I'm going to measure this in a minute. I'm going to get the optimum um, diameter, so uh, full circle. I'm going to measure that. We're going to create the foot. That's going to be a sacrificial foot we'll take away at the end. And then I can start thinking about shape or well, sand. We're going to put an oil on this one. And then once we've done that, we can reverse them over, grip the foot, take the inside out, reverse it one more time, because then we can take away that foot that we used to hold the piece on in the first place. Okay, so the C jaws are the ones we're going to use. So if I take a measurement from those now, and we're going to use um, a set of dividers then just to scribe, scribe a line. I'll give you a measurement in a second. So there we are. So that's okay. I keep putting... Uh, I'm sure you're the same in your own workshop, so keep putting things down and losing them. The amount of glasses I've lost on the top of my head or pencils I've lost in my pocket. Um, so we're looking at, um, so I want to be a 50, a 58 mil in, in uh, total. Okay, so now I'm going to mask up, so my visor's going on. Charlie's just put his on. So lay speed to zero, turn the machine on. Just make the mark, I'm going to double check. And then we can cut that, cut that in. I'm going to put it in with a parting tool. This is my foot. That's all I need to do. We don't need to be too deep. And the reason we don't need to be too deep is because the actual gripping area in here is quite small. It's a tooth. So that's what we're relying on. So I don't need to go, you know, quarter, quarter inch, Sort of eight mil or anything like that. I can I can stick fairly shallow. Um, are they SK one hundred jaws? Um, these are. This is the SK one one four. Okay, SK one one four. So this is the one one four jaws. Um, but they are the same um, size as the one hundred as well as the SK one hundred. So they're exactly the same size. The difference between these and the one hundred jaws is a little bit more metal on the outside here. It's the only difference. And do you blunt the points on dividers or calipers? Uh, uh, from you, yes. It's worth just taking a bit of abrasive to them, just, just dull them down a little bit. They will catch otherwise, so just a little bit. And make sure whatever part of the divider is touching the um, timber is touching the tool rest as well. Um, if you think you're sizing a, um, a diameter like this, there's no need to touch centre point. You can hover over it, but you will need to touch the tool rest where you're where actual marking on this area here. All right, okay, so let's go with, I'm just grabbing one of the gouges. I don't know whether it's sharp, we'll soon see. And I'm just gonna drag out. Drag into the outside edge. So this is known as a pull cut. There's no bevel rubbing on a pull cut. We're literally just dragging that tip over. The bevel is the ground section here. We will make that rub in a second. That's going to be our finishing cut. So at the moment, I've got the handle over my side of the lathe, and I'm dragging 
dragging toward me. Now a lot of people ask why I, why I do that with the hand. That's simple, it's just a, a chip deflector. If I do this, the shavings can come up at me. If I do that, then they stop it from happening. So we're almost down to the level of the, the recess there, there we are. Okay, so let's just stop the lathe. We'll show you what, we're, what we've been dealing with at the moment. I have no need to touch this area because that won't be touching the chuck. It's only this area and this area that's going to be touching the chuck. So that needs to be clean. I'm going to do that now just with a little um, negative rate scraper, i.e. the skew. So just a little scrape there. And that area is going to be my true base. Good. Okay, so my true base is going to be about there, I guess. So we're now going to take away bulk material, a very simple shape. So you can see what we're doing there. With that roughing cut, we're literally just pulling away the, the excess material. We're not going to get a good finish with that. The finish is going to be poor, um, purely because there's no bevel rubber and we're not supporting the timber. So we're going to do a finishing cut before we, we actually start sand though. Nice simple shape. So, my true base, I'm not going to come straight down and then a flat, I'm going to put a little uplift. Just a little shadow line. And don't be held, I'll take my mask off to explain this. Don't be held hostage either by your bowl blank. So let's say you've bought a bowl blank which is three inches, 75 mil thick, um, but the shape is good at that point and you've still got a lot of timber left. It's always, uh, it's, you know, we, we spend a lot of money on timber. Um, it's always sort of, you want to use all of that bowl blank, but sometimes that can be at the detriment of the design of the piece. So if you've got a nice shape and you've still got timber up here, don't worry about that. You're still going to have a nice piece at the end. I would stick with the shape over maximising that timber and come up with a nice shape at the end of it. Um, I, like I say, I always worry about it when we when we spend so much on our timber. Um, I spent nothing on this piece because it's a scrap wood piece, so and it's looking quite nice so far. Um, so let's just finish the shape, then we'll do a nice finishing cut before sanding. There we are. I don't want to come off the edge, otherwise I'll end up um, breaking out. So I'm just going to drop the handle of the dowel, just do a little skew cut. Um, how deep is the shadow line? Probably about three mil, about an eighth of an inch there. I, I would have said. And um, once we. Once we've done this, Charlie's going to move around in a minute, only because my handle now is going to come around this way and it's going to get in the in the way of the camera. So I'm going to maximum there, Charlie. So anywhere close to that would be grand. Is that good? You see this area okay? This is the working area. Right there. Center on that area a bit, come close. I just want you to center on where we're working, that's all. That's brilliant. Down a bit. So center on this area. That's it, thank you. Perfect. 
Okay, so now we're going to start rubbing the bevel. I'm going to actually turn the laser boot up a little bit. It's a bit, a bit slow. So rubbing the bevel. So I've come from over here with my handle, and now I'm bringing the handle over the other side of the lathe, rubbing the bevel. Now don't try and get that bevel right into that shadow line, otherwise you'll just create a very deep um, groove there. Start with the bevel rubbing. If you don't have to get close, you don't have to get right in there. Get the bevel rubbing. Now I'm going to push up the length of the tool, a bit faster. I'm going to push up the length of the tool and let that bevel slide along the surface of the timber. Now we're cutting, so we're not scraping anymore. And this is a cut you just want to have a practice with. You're not going to get it right every time. You might have a bit of bevel bounce. Um, we're using an iPhone camera, by the way. Yeah, we're on my iPhone, my iPhone, iPhone XR we're using. There, we are. that's quite nice, isn't it? I'm quite chuffed with that. There's a lot of grain going on in there. I did pick some rather nice oak. There's a couple of different colours of oak there, some maple, some tulip. Um, this is some uh, pieces of sonicellin, sonicellin, um, so peely, but pretty. We can start, start sanding now. Um, let me just say what I was about to say there. So we're t I was talking about um, this cut. So when you're making that cut, you push up the length of the tool, you let the bevel slide. If you press too hard, you can get a, um, uh, something called bevel bounce star. And bevel bounce is basically too much pressure on bevel. It hits the hard end grain and bounces off of it. But it's doing it fast, obviously, all that rotation. And then that acts like um, an echo. It gets bigger and bigger the further up that bowl you go to the bigger diameter. You've actually got to um, slacken some of the pressure away. So make a lighter cut, um, go back to before it started and skim the surface and you will get rid of it. Um, but that's a cut finish as opposed to a scraped finish that will massively help your, your sanding now um, be a much, much easier thing to sand. So let's get on and sand that. How long have we been, Charlie? We've been quite a while, haven't we? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Oh, that's not too long. 23 minutes. After bowl, then. Right, we'll have the dust extractor going. I'm going to mix up my extraction. Sorry, I'm going to mix, mix up my, my sanding. We're do, going to do a mixture of hand sanding. And I'm going to go 100, 150, 240, 400. Um, but we're also going to uh, throw in some rotary sanding as well. So a hand rotary sander, not a power sander, just a hand rotary sander. And I'm going to put in there a 180, a 240, and a 400. That will just help cancel each other out. It means I can get through the sanding process a little bit uh, quicker. Um, do you use an air filter as well as a dust collector? An air I haven't got an air filter, no. Um, that is uh, the, your next level again. So at the moment I've got two dust extractors in here. Um, I've got the 60E, um, which we're using at the moment. That's soon to be upgraded by my um, Cyclone extractor. Again, just a quick pan around, Charlie. Bit of a mess at the moment. Um, my messy workshop. Um, the Cyclone extractor is going in um, probably, uh, I'm gonna start that this weekend. Um, so there will be a much bigger extractor going in. Um, but for the moment, I've just got that one. And then of course, my own personal protection, my PPE, so I've got um, my Evolution, my APF-10, um, and uh, again, I'm hoping to go up the next level of that fairly soon when my pocket can afford it, um, to uh, a battery pack on the, the hip. Slightly bigger motor, that's all I want. For an um, everyday turn of the APF-10 is fantastic, but I'm in, literally in this room, my workshop, usually about seven days a week, um, and when I'm not working for Axminster teaching, I'm in here in, here in the uh, evenings practicing, um, on normal circumstances of course, um, in here practicing making things. I'm a maker at the end of the day, so I make lots of lots of other things and sell them and, um, and work for magazines where I'm making things as well. So it's a non-stop thing, so I just need that little extra level um, to cope with all the extra work I'm doing. Right then, sanding, so away we go. So Charlie, could you put the extractor on? So I'm not actually slowing down 
slowing the lathe down. You might want to slow the lathe down at your house if you're getting a lot of dust. But remember my background, my background was production. We were never allowed to slow the lathe down. So you basically move around the piece. But you're not in it for speed. You're in it to make some uh, nice things. So um, take your time, sand nice and slowly, straps are nice and close, put your BB on and um, yeah, just take care. That was the 100 grit. I want to make sure that there are no nasties, no tears or anything. A little bit of tearing on the maple. We'll just get rid of that. Okay, now moving up to 150. So we'll put a little bit of oil on that. You watch the colours jump out when we do. Um, so it's a nice nice grouping of timbers there. I don't need to oil this. This isn't part of the finished bowl. So we're just going to do that for the moment. Um, it says, what is a tube you have uh, nearest to the workspace? Say that again. The what tube. The tube. This, this one, I'm guessing you're, you're talking about. This is um, a material called stay put hose now we as a company axman tools we sell this in meter lengths i get a meter and break it into two halves and it's just a really good option for for, uh, for your dust extractor that's on a portable height um, stand and this fits directly into it and you can increase the size of the um, the ends um, just by unwinding it and it makes it larger or smaller so nice little addition to the dust extractor there and um, what's the benefits of a rotary sander? A rotary sander, if you think about how you're sanding, if you sand in one direction all the time, it's quite hard to get rid of those scratches. What I want to do is after I've done the coarse sanding is get rid of them because those are the ones that will always be there at the end if you see any scratches. So that's why I go 100 and 150 by hand. Then use the two four, uh, sorry, the 180 and that gives you a slightly different scratch across your original ones, like crisscrossing almost. 
and then you keep rotating, you will go through your, your sanding much, much quicker than just using one method. You can, of course, um, power sand, um, which is another quick way, quite aggressive way, um, but I just find that way just, just a nice way to work. Now, I'm gonna do this slowly, because it's a nice part of the job, and you'll see the colors of the grain just explode out of that bowl blank now. Um, it's been half an hour. It's been half an hour, thanks, Charlie. So this isn't an accident, the color scheme here. I have selected them. I've made sure that they're in a certain order, um, and we've got contrasting colors next to each other. Some lovely bits of rippling going through some of this maple. Um, and the sapili actually, and some nice dark um, sinopin in the middle. There we are. So that's a bit of oil. That was chestnut food safe oil because I had it next to me. But the finishing oil would be would work quite as well uh, as well. Uh, also, um, but that's going to work well. I'm going to sand it in very slowly. So lay speed to zero and about 150 res. I'm just going to do a little bit of sanding with the 600 grit. All I want to do here is build up a slurry between the dust and the um, and the oil and just start that drying process of, of the oil. So just a little bit of sanding. I'll wipe off the excess then. Um, do you ever use cut and polish or Yorkshire grit? Both of those, yeah. They're both um, I don't use them an awful lot, um, but I have used them. Yes, they're both similar things. Um, I probably use cut and polish more. That's chestnut uh, product. That works really well. Um, it's an abrasive um, abrasive wax polish. Um, exactly the same as Yorkshire grit. It's a nice, nice material to use, a nice substance to use. Um, my favourite things to use in terms of polishing, I have different different reasons for using different um, polishes, but oil I quite use, like using on big things. I like the satin finishes. I'm not keen on ultra gloss sort of finishes on this sort of project. So I would use a wax or an oil, that sort of thing. Um, on the smaller projects, maybe um, things like bottle stoppers, um, jewelry, I quite like those to be quite glossy. So I'll use friction polishes, epoxies, um, acrylic lacquers, those sorts of things. Um, French polishes is something that I've been brought up with quite a lot. So the small bowls and things like that, we used to layer up French polishes. Uh, that was quite nice. There we are. What a lovely, a lovely um, grouping of timber. Now that polish is on there. That oil is on there. So, um, does it work with softer woods? This type of project. Yeah. We looking yet? Yeah. Um, the only issue I have with soft timbers is they they do like to split quite well. Um, so do the same thing, glue them together. Don't go too big with softwood. It won't like, you know, structurally it's not, it's not as strong as these materials and you certainly can't go too thin. Watch the end grain for splitting on softwoods as well. Um, they're quite fragile. I'm just using the, the, um, the face plate as a handle. I find it much easier to do it this way and then I'll take off um, the face plate. Um, so yes, you can use softwood. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Um, everything you do, you need to make sure the surfaces are nice and clean and smooth, planed, um, clamped well, left well to dry, and that glue is a good quality, in-date glue. You know, if this came apart, it could cause serious damage, so you want to make sure the job is done well. Don't rush it. Got ten minutes left. You've got ten minutes left. I thought today, oh it's only a bomb. We'll run through that one really, really quickly. We'll be done early. And then I start talking. Right, so I will move a little bit quicker now. We're going to hollow this one out. I'm going to sand it really quick. I want to just take the back off for you. So we're not going to be done in 45 minutes. We're going to be done just shy of the hour. Lay speed to zero before we start anything. Lay speed on. I'm just going to trickle that on and get my PPE on. So I'm down below centre again. I'm not going to go massively thin. Massively thin. That's contradicting. I'm not going to go really thin. 
Charlie's got his visor, just putting his visor on now. And also, we're, both of us are going to be out the line of fire as well. You think about this bowl blank here, and we're both going to be out of the way. So if worst case scenario happens, then we don't get, uh, we don't get hit. Um, it's happened to me before, a long time ago, and I don't want it to happen again. Um, do you think these videos will carry on after lockdown? If I'm absolutely honest with you, I don't know, but um, I certainly want to carry them on. Um, as a company, we are really enjoying them um, and are really chuffed with the response that we've had from everybody. So it's just down to response, really. If it carries on as successfully as it has, then all your support um, will make it happen. So I'm keen to make them happen, yes. There we are. And I like working with Charlie as well. It's another bonus for me. I'm in my own workshop. I can do my own things. I've got, the, got my boy with me. So it's a nice, fun thing to be able to do. Now, all I'm doing here, I'm just starting with the rim. I want to get the rim thickness right. Um, so that's taking away some of that uh, timber that I haven't used. Let's just stop and have a look and see what the finish is like at the moment. I, oh, I you know, I think I want to make the most of this um, of this piece. So I'm going to have a fairly wide rim on this one. So I'm going to just make a very slight um, convex curve on the top rim and our rim is going to be wide-ish So we're going to start answering a few questions now. Um, the main question that I was wanting to tackle was from, um, from Lee. Um, and that was about the caption. So one of the big issues, let me sharpen this gouge actually and then we'll talk about it. Um, the big issue is about, about that grab, that digging, um, which is an issue a lot of people have. If you present your gouge like that, that left hand wing this wing here is actually contacting the timber as it comes down all that happens is is that um blade then will just dive into the timber uncontrollably that's the catches you're getting lee and um, so what we must do is turn that flute over now on the inside we're turning the flute over so it's facing um anywhere really between one o'clock and, and sort of two two thirty ish um depending on the style of cut you want on the outside of the bowl, you'll turn the flute the other way because when you're doing your finishing cut, because you want the bevel rubbing. So there, we're looking at anything between sort of 11 o'clock and 9.30. Um, I always generally say, hands on the steering wheel, 10 and 2 o'clock. You can't go wrong with those, um, especially when you're learning to start with. So on the outside of the bowl like this, on the inside where we are, we're like this. The other thing is when we're on the inside of the bowl, think about how the the presentation of that cutting edge is. It's going to be like that to start with. Um, and when we're on the very last cut, you might want to just turn the tool over just to make that last cut. Handle all the way over the other side of the lathe. Pause at the beginning of the cut, and then proceed. And I'll do that for you. Let's sharpen this gouge. I'm using my Tormek bowl gouge jig at the moment. Okay, so we use my bowl gouge jig. I've got a 65 uh, millimeter protrusion. I'm on jig setting number four on the side here um, and on the little setup gu um, gauge. Hang on, I've just dropped something. On the little setup gauge, there we are. On the little setup gauge, 
I'm using hole A. That's going to give us the distance from the machine. So 65 mil. Okay. Nice quick sharpen. Done. And that's been sharpened on a CBN wheel. Now we're going to start shifting a little bit of hollowing. We're not going to go straight to the bottom of the, the bowl immediately, otherwise I won't know where the bottom is. So the beginning of your cut, if you get lots of grabs where it wants to kick this way, that's probably because your handle's too far toward your body. So push the handle away, the other side of the lathe. If it's still happening, turn the flute over to three o'clock. That creates a little line. Once you've got that line, then you can turn the flute back and push. Just have a check. I'm going to pinch the thickness now. Happy. I'm happy with that. Happy with that. So let's take the middle out. Now, of course, now I've pinched the thickness, I'm not in danger of going through the bottom. I know that's um, a good thickness. I can now just cut straight across. Stop and have a look. See if there's any problem areas before we start sanding. So I'm going to turn the speed up a little bit. This is still a bit chunky. I'm not quite happy with that. So how much time have we got left, Joel? It's been 45 minutes. Been 45 minutes, right? Always worth just taking a slightly smaller cut when you get to the middle. If you're taking a big cut here, you can start ripping things out. Now I've got a gravy bump in the middle, we've got that lump, so a little bit more. Good to go, let's sand, let's sand. So we've got a lovely clean cut going on there because we've got the bowl gouge working nicely. So sanding is going to be a breeze it's going to be nice and easy if you were using a scraper that doesn't always happen um, i know you can do a finishing cut with a scraper but if you're rough cutting with a scraper then you tend to get a lot more tear a lot more breakout and wooliness okay so let's sand up no uh, no hesitating here because i want to finish this for you just seconds quite yeah. a few questions coming at once here okay sorry. um so how do you pre prevent um dark wood giving lighter wood the shadow effect I'm thinking, you guess, you're talking about bleeding um, here. And that is an issue. Pick your woods wisely. Sapili's a good one, oak's a good one. 
Um, you can suffer with it with um, Sonic Helling, um, but I've only got two thin strips here. I would avoid timbers like Paduk. Paduk will bleed its colour through ever so easily. Avoid those if you're going to start laminating. Um, but these timbers, I know these don't bleed out very much, that's all. Um, would you not do a pull cut to clean the bottom out? No. Definitely not. I would always go for my push cut with my bevel rubbing. All the time. Was the chattering due to the depth over the tool rest? You can, yeah, absolutely. You're also going to get chattering and bevel bounce sometimes with a single bevel. So you may have noticed that gouge that I was using then had a double bevel on it. All right. This time I'm presenting more of a convex curve than a flat one to an internal curve. And then um, once again, what's your view about turning out a bowl edge to centre or centre out and which is the best? Um, if it's this orientation, grain running this way, I will always cut um, down towards centre point. Finishing cut, so keep making the cut, I'm starting in the middle until I'm up to my right diameter and then I'll finish the bottom off. Always do it that way. It, with this grain orientation. Right, we're going to whiz through this now. Abrasive paper are you using? So this abrasive is RB paper, known as the ultimate abrasive um, from Hermes. RB paper. It's listed as the ultimate abrasive. Wood turner's abrasive. Alternatively, Abrana. Abronet's another good one. That's quite a good one because it's perforated, so you get that um, less temperature build-up. get your exotic hardwoods and do they deliver UK wise? Okay. I'll answer that one. Yeah, just just real. I'm gonna keep sanding and finish on um, where do I get exotic hardwoods? I don't really buy exotic hardwoods anymore. This is stuff that I've got that I've had knocking around the workshop for quite a while. Um, oh, where would I buy exotic hardwoods? I'll be honest, I don't know. I mean Axminster Tools tool sell we do uh, the common ones, Paduke, uh, Bubinga, Zabranos, up to two inches in most cases. Um, we're also doing the new bowl blanks, but that's the native hardwoods, like um, the sycamores, elms, and all that sort of stuff. 
and that'll be in bold lengths and squares. Um, I, 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 you're asking the wrong man, I'm afraid. I'm really sorry. I, I just don't buy exotic hardwoods anymore. Um, internet. That's the, <laughs> that's the answer. That's what I say about everything. Right, carry on sanding. <laughs> Occasions would you use a smaller diameter bowl sander head? Bowl sander, it's smaller bowls. I mean, it's it, 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 this. Sometimes that uh, seventy-five mil one is just too big to get into those smaller pieces. So um, yeah, the smaller one's much easier. There we are. Bit of a shout out, hello there to Paul Otter. Um, interesting question, Paul. You know me. Um, yes, um, my singing voice is amazing, um, and as it's Charlie's birthday tonight, I'm sure it will come out just a couple of times. Um, another big shout out to Nick Agar. Nick's birthday was yesterday. If you know Nick Agar from Wood Turning Demonstrations, you know fantastic turner he is. I certainly encourage you to look at his website, look at his videos. Incredible work. He was, I know I can tell you how old he is, but like I say, his birthday was yesterday. So remember, the this was a suggestion. Could we do a scrapwood bowl by Brian? And from an original uh, video on YouTube uh, by a French turner called Olivia Gomez. Really, I've done it a slightly different way. He um, he didn't waste as much as I have. He cut, hit the centre out, and glued it back together again. So he did a fantastic job of it. Um, there we are. Now let's just quickly. How much time have I got, Charlie? Five minutes. Five minutes. We've got just enough time. Now that's wet still. I'd want to really leave that and re-burnish it. Okay, but let me just take that back away very quickly. Um, why does chatter occur? Why does chatter occur? Chatter occurs for lots of reasons. Chatter occurs. Um, it can be, like was suggested earlier, it can be tourists too far away. It could be using a, a, a gouge that's too small for the um, job you're doing. So if I was using a quarter or six mil gouge on that, for instance, then it would chatter all day long. The other reason is bevel bounce. Bevel bounce 
causes a vibration which sounds like a chatter. Bevel bounce can occur on a skew chisel, on a bowl gouge, on a spindle gouge, many, many tools. Uh, tail stock, there it is. So I'm not going to have time to finish this, but I'm going to show you how we can. I have showed you this before um, on our live videos, but there's a lot of new people since the, the first couple of weeks of the live videos. So it'd be good just to cover this one more time. One thing I have forgotten to do on this one is actually make a center mark. So we're going to have to guess pretty much where center is, but it'll work regardless. Um, center, center, center. And someone asked if I turned. I Charlie started turning when he was six. He was making, sorry, I usually talk to yourself, Charlie. Um, he was, when he was six, making um, pens and um, spinning tops. Pens for teachers and spinning tops for friends um, on a milk crate up to the lathe. Um, and my eldest son, uh, Finley, started at the same age doing the same thing. Um, don't do quite as much now, but... Uh, there we are. So what we've got supported um, the bowl on a push plate. I'm going to do the initial cuts and then I will show you this one finished when we next meet on Tuesday. But just to give you an idea. Three minutes left. Three minutes left, so very quick idea. Um, put some goals on. So we're supported by the push plate. I can now, using the small gouge, So you can see what I'm doing there. See what I'm doing there. I'm just supporting with the tail stock, taking away the foot. I'll then take the tail stock away. Okay, and just put a little sander in my little sander in my um, chuck, and then we can sand that little nib away, and uh, jobs are good. And so there we are, Charlie. I think we can finish there. Push plate, incidentally, is a piece of plywood. Some router matting um, to adhesive to uh, the front face. So that's our little nod um, to Olivia Gomez, um, French wood turner who inspired us to do this one. Thanks for Brian for the idea. Now we're off to celebrate um, Charlie's birthday. Um, I'm gonna look forward to seeing you again on Tuesday. I think we're gonna do some small projects. We haven't done small projects yet. So small projects on Tuesdays. Until then, have a wonderful weekend, happy turning, um, and I'll see you on Tuesday. Same time, same place, my workshop, four o'clock.